welcome. Thanks for joining us. May the Holy Spirit work in your life as you hear this message. Ministry can steer the course of history. It may not seem like it in the moment. It might not seem like it even decades later. But ministry can steer the course of history. Way back in the mid-18th century, 1748 in fact, a group of Methodists in Bristol, that's a city in western England, started up a school to educate the sons of local miners. They called it the Kingswood School, and a few years later they began including the sons of itinerant Methodist preachers. One Kingswood student in particular had, as one biography tells it, something of a scandalous background. It seems that one Joseph Pilmore was the illegitimate son of Sarah Pilmore and Joseph Ford, who denied that he was Joseph's father. Now, even with this background, Joseph Pilmore found Methodism at the age of 16 from John Wesley himself, and then he obtained his education at Kingswood. In 1769, Pilmore and another Methodist preacher by the name of Richard Boardman sailed for the American colonies and ministered in what are now the oldest Methodist churches in America, one in New York and one in Philadelphia. Pilmore served as a tireless and effective evangelist during his time in New York, he preached in the areas we now know as the boroughs several times a week. He lived in lower Manhattan, but he often traveled as far north as the Bronx just to preach the gospel. Now remember, this is in the days before cars, before buses, before taxis, before subways, definitely before Uber. And so after three years of commuting between New York City and Philadelphia, sometimes in the dead of winter by boat, Pilmore traveled and preached in Pennsylvania and Virginia and even as far south as North Carolina. Okay, so now you're going to have to dig into his journals to learn this little tidbit, but Pilmore is probably one of the first Methodist preachers in America to get in a fight with his board of trustees. <laughs> oh, yes. And the argument as to whose name should go on the deed to the church property in New York City, that argument got so heated that letters, angry letters, were sent to John Wesley to remove Pilmore from his, that church. It seems like some things just never change. <laughs> now, now, difficulties aside, Joseph Pilmore occupies a special place in Methodist history and on a smaller scale in American history. John Street United Methodist Church in New York is the oldest Methodist church in the United States, and as far as I can tell from its website, it is still going. Over 200 continuous years of ministry. And so is the Kingswood School, believe it or not. But Pilmore played a role in Methodist history only because a previous group of Methodists embarked on a mission to educate the sons of miners in Bristol, England. Ministry can indeed steer history. Ministry can shape the world so long as that ministry strives to love God above all else and our neighbors as ourselves. Love will change the world. 
not hate. Now, loving neighbor is not always easy. Sometimes it's downright hard, especially in this particular environment. And there may be those times when we ask ourselves, well, who is my neighbor really? Who deserves my love and my help? Well, as we will soon read in our Scripture, Jesus is loving even when we cannot be. Let's strive to live into His love. Okay, so we've been reading through the Gospel according to Luke all year, and it's really hard to believe, but Joyce, it is almost Easter, just a few more weeks, and we're still only on the 10th chapter. It is really, really hard to get through the entire Gospel in just... 12 or 14 weeks. Suffice it to say that at this point, Jesus has turned His intention toward Jerusalem and to the cross and to the tomb and to the resurrection that awaits. So now at this point, the questions come. The dining with the tax collectors and the sinners, the healing on the Sabbath, the endless questions about His authority. Over and over again, his critics appear out of the woodwork and take every chance they have to discredit him. So this time, a lawyer comes along and asks Jesus what he thinks is a tricky question. And it looks to me like he comes away with a a pretty surprising answer. So let's read the gospel according to Luke chapter 10 verses 25 through 37. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. I wonder if after this, the lawyer actually goes out and does likewise. 
Because the story doesn't say. Or does the lawyer take what Jesus says to him and then head out to lunch with his lawyer friends, as so many churchgoers do today, and promptly forget about all this love your neighbor stuff? You know, every now and then I, I read on social media. Social media is the worst thing to read, actually. But, but I read every now on social media that, that lunchtime on Sunday is actually the most dreaded time of the week for waiters and waitresses. Did you know this? Okay. Well, apparently, this is because church-going folks, not anybody in here, mind you, church-going folks writ large, have developed a reputation as being the worst tippers. And <laughs> Lord have mercy, exactly. And apparently some waiters and waitresses receive criticism for working on Sunday. From, from the people, criticism from the people they're working for. I mean, like, hi. Who would serve the after-church crowd if everyone didn't work on Sunday? And, Reverend Ann, what would football fans do <laughs> on Sunday afternoon, okay, if it were not required by contract for athletes to work on Sunday? Not to mention all the folks who work in the stadiums and all the folks who work in television. Friends, we should be the best tippers. We should be the most patient, most gracious, most forgiving, most understanding, and most pleasant of customers. No pretension to piety is going to bring the good news to life among people who have to work on Sunday. Because I'm sure they'd rather not work either. Loving our neighbors, that is, seeking the well-being of others, is one of our most basic biblical commandments. But just as we don't know whether the lawyer goes out and does likewise, we might want to ask ourselves if we do the same. Now the question asked at the beginning of the story, what must I do to inherit eternal life, appears in Mark and Matthew as well. In those two Gospels, Jesus answers the question directly, but in Luke, he asks the lawyer to answer the question himself, drawing from what the lawyer knows, that is, the law. And in Mark and Matthew, no one asks, who is my neighbor? This is unique to Luke. But when the, the lawyer asks, who is my neighbor, Jesus then follows up with a story about a man robbed and beaten and left for dead on a road, aided by a man from the dreaded land of Samaria. Okay, so it's now about, it's 16 miles or so from Jerusalem to Jericho, and our founder, John Wesley, points out that the road from Jerusalem to Jericho had an infamous reputation it was actually called the bloody way. And apparently, if you look at travel blogs, apparently it is still rather a rough hike to go down that road. So this man suffers a terrible beating and robbery, and a priest and a Levite both pass him by. Now, might they have a reason? Let's think about that. You see, according to the law in the book of Numbers, touching a dead body results in a state of ritual uncleanness for which one must go through a period of purification. So, the priest and the Levite, having their religious duties to perform, might not wish to take the time to touch a dead body. The only problem is, he ain't dead! He's not dead! It would not be unlawful for the priest or the Levite to pick the poor man up and carry him to safety. 
they choose not to. So, along comes this man from Samaria, a nation detested by the people of Israel and Judah for their worship of foreign idols. Back in the book of 2 Kings, right, the king of Assyria pacifies the region by migrating people from different parts of the Middle East into Samaria. And, and so the newcomers all bring their idols and their own gods. And eventually the Samarians kind of meld the, face together, the faiths together and eventually they worship the God of Israel as well as their own idols. And so this re religious tension exists between the people of Samaria and the people of Israel and Judah. This tension persists all the way through the centuries, right down into the time of Jesus. So it must startle the lawyer to hear Jesus bring a Samaritan into a conversation about eternal life. Now notice also how Jesus uses the particularity of a man left for dead on the side of a road to offer a lesson on the majestic boundlessness of living in God's love. Eternal life doesn't limit itself to what happens after we die whether or not we've recited the doctrinally correct incantations before our final moments pass. Eternal life means to live in fullness, to live in genuine faith, to dwell among the living in the here and now. To live eternally is to live in the way of those who have gone before us all along the centuries, the loving way that persists across the millennia. And biblical love has very little to do with the people we like. It means to give of ourselves for the good of others, even those who live and believe a little bit differently from us. I came up with, with a rather simple way to look at this. And it's derived from an old Navy adage. Some of you might so this might sound familiar to some of you, and it is just as challenging. You don't got to like them. You just got to love them. I don't know if the other branches of the military say you don't got to like it, you just got to do it, but you just got to love them. And finally, the word neighbor in Luke's gospel reaches a cross borders and cultures and language and, and even religious practice. It has less to do with the proximity of our households and more to do with the compassion, the, the gut feeling we experience when we come across other people in a state of suffering. In the Gospel according to Luke, love of neighbor has far more to do with how we respond to people in need honestly than anything else. So if we ask whether the lawyer actually goes and does likewise after his encounter with Jesus, we might want to ask the same thing. Given the state of the world today, given what we can readily find by reading human history, it seems as though a great many people who profess faith in Jesus Christ have not done likewise for over 2,000 years. And still some don't. World wars, cold wars, proxy wars, regional conflicts, civil wars, culture wars, racial strife, Families and marriages and friendships dissolving over partisan politics. Churches and denominations splitting over their differences. It is, too, it is all too easy, especially as a relative newcomer to church, it is all too easy to descend into despondence over all this fighting. 
it almost never stops. In so many ways, even though we are told to love one another on Sunday, it seems like we forget all about it on Sunday afternoon. I mean, I won't, I won't even get into Monday. Okay, and the rest of the week, forget about it, right? When are we going to realize that everyone around us, everyone, regardless of politics or persuasion, is our neighbor? The lawyer in the gospel cannot even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. Just the one who showed mercy. Don't make me say it. Well, how about we say it? Can we look upon a stranger, a foreigner, as a neighbor? Can we look at the folks across the political aisles, across the picket lines, across the national borders, across the skin color and the language differences and the income disparities and the wardrobe? Can we, can we look past each other? Can we look at each other across the Mason-Dixon line or the Floridian equivalent of such? Okay, Because I've lived here for 10 years and I still sense a degree of hostility towards New Yorkers. <laughs> just, just say it. I don't want to bellyache about this, but, you know, it's there. Ask me about the pickup truck story one day. I'll, I'll tell you. Oh, yes. I mean, really, is it all that hard? Is it all that hard? No, it shouldn't be, right? But even if it is, even if there are some people we just cannot bring ourselves to love. Jesus is loving where we cannot be. Jesus loves the lawyer who questions him. Jesus loves the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests. Jesus loves the disciples who betray him, who abandon him, and who deny knowing him. He loves the soldiers who crucify him. In the gospel according to Luke, as we will read in coming weeks, he prays for all their forgiveness. Though our love may fail, he loves us still. And God's love lived through us can steer the course of history. Let's live it now. Amen. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, give us eyes to see your face in the face of those who are strangers to us, in the faces of those we fear, in the faces of those who humiliate us. God, may we see your face in the faces of those we detest, those with whom we are angry, those from whom we are estranged, God, give us eyes to see our neighbor, even, yes, our enemies, as you see us. God, we thank you for every blessing in life. We give you thanks for your son, Jesus, whom you sent into this world because you do love us and you so love us. And he gave of himself that we might all be forgiven of our sin 
that eternal life may be open to us and that we can, with the guidance of your Holy Spirit, right now live brand new loving days today, this minute. And so God, in gratitude for him, we now offer you the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share our video. Let's send God's love all over the world. If you find yourself in Jensen Beach, Florida, please join us for worship. Our services are at 9, 15, and 11. And if you'd like to find out more, please visit www.trinityjb.org. See you next time. Blessings.